Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths, or Mr. Nmon to my friends. I work at IBM Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This is a series on AIX, AIX in focus. This video is about the JFS2 or Journal File System 2 or Enhanced Journal File System. These videos are for systems administrators, so we're not going to cover the basic Unix, AX, Linux user level commands. Although I might have a go at VI because I've seen some terrible movies about it, which is essentially a very simple editor. The JFS2 file system was voted 10th favorite feature of AIX out of 32, and five of those in the top 10 were actually parts of the hardware that AIX runs on. Briefly, this is an enterprise class file system with decades of field hardening and tuning. And that word decades is important there. I found very early on working in services at IBM that something that really, really annoys our customers is if you have file system corruption and you destroy their data. It's really hard work to get back the data perhaps from last week's backup, rewind the tapes, get you back to where you were. You do that two or three times in a row and they are really, really mad. It's very important to have a boring file system that just keeps the data safe. You also want it to be fast and we've had a lot of time in AX's history to improve the performance of a file system until it's a very very thin layer for maximum disk performance. So some of the hot features of JFS2 it's a logging or journaling file system so it journals puts into a log the structural changes to the file system. If you've create directories or change the size of files that metadata is logged so that when you have a server failure you can replay the log and get the file system structure back up to date. It's not logging the actual data in the files. It's a user or application responsibility to flush that data out at regular points in time. It also has very fast access, lots of tuning over the decades. JFS2 allows the growing and shrinking of all file systems, including the root file system. It also allows direct I.O. or concurrent I.O. for relational database management systems because they're caching their data, and so the JFS2 stands aside and you have direct access to the disk blocks. It also has a snapshot feature that allows rapid returning to a known point in time, and you can use that for backups too. It has encryption built into JFS2. JFS2. You don't need a different file system to do encryption. It's the same one. It's an option that you can switch on. There's also an option for inline logging. So it allows the full life cycles of your data files and directories. We can use a command line interface or we can use Smitty to actually create and remove them. And we have just this one excellent file system and that avoids you having to make decisions about which file system to use. There's one excellent one rather than having to decide between many good alternatives now i love linux i love playing with that i actually get paid to play with linux but it does have some fundamental problems there's about what uh, half a dozen good file systems uh, linux i did a quick tour around the internet and uh, the ext4 and the zfs seem to be the most popular at the moment so i prefer having one really really good file system with every feature i could possibly want rather than a couple of pretty good file systems with some key features missing. And that's the luxury we've had with AIX for the past 20 years. The original AIX came out with JFS, note the missing two, that was in 1990. It was a major upgrade of Unix at the time, AIX is built on the uh, Unix code, it uses the Unix inode organization and it was doing journaling that, to avoid the file system check after a crash. As systems get bigger and bigger, the file system checks takes longer and longer and you can wait for hours to get the machine back up. Some people call that the classic JFS and that was very reliable and pretty fast. In 2001, we moved to the enhanced JFS or JFS2. This is extent based allocation. It reduces the file management for massive files and massive file systems. Higher performance, we have some tuning in there, and the code path reduction to make sure it's really quick. I'm sure these numbers will go up at some point in the future, but currently the JFS2 has a maximum file system size, the total file system of 32 terabytes, the maximum single file is 16 terabytes. The minimum size of a journal file system is 16 megabytes, which is tiny these days. You could fit that onto a USB memory key, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. I had originally planned to do a live demonstration of creating a file system, but it's a simple command. You don't really want to sit there and say type in this command and then explain what's going on. So let's do the command line 
way of creating a file system it needs to go into a logical volume now the next video I'm going to make be about the logical volume management but let's say we've got a volume group in here which is a group of disks out of which we can allocate some space for a file system so in this command we've got create file system minus v jfs2 jfs1 or the original classic is still there shouldn't really be using that because jfs2 is much better to use and more flexible so the minus g option is the volume group in which you want to get the space from minus a sizes it equals 42g well that's 42 gigabytes where do you want that mounted that's the minus m option and a couple of ones which i think you could default in actually but the minus a yes means auto mount when you reboot your aix and minus p is the read write access permissions to the file system the alternative would be uh, read only so I've got here the description of the various features that uh, we've been talking about there. You type this command, hit go, it'll take maybe a second and you'll have your file system created. But you must go and mount that file system yourself. You have to you know, mount a command slash temp. It's not rocket science. I've often asked them, couldn't they just put an option and, it's a, and mount it for me now option? But nope, that's never got the go ahead. So you have to remember that. If you don't remember that, then you may find all the data you're putting into slash temp is going into a directory in your root file system. And you fill that up and then horrible things can actually happen. So be careful with that one. Although I think most people have to learn the hard way. So use the user level commands to make directories and subdirectories, copy some files in, all that sort of work. Then you decide, well, actually, I didn't quite get the file system right. I want to make it slightly bigger. So this is where it really pays off. So we can use this change file system command, give it a size. And then you say, well, rather than working out what size it is now and adding eight to it, you can just say, give me eight gigabytes more. This could be an M in here if you want as well to make very fine tunes. And you tell the file system and it just adds almost instantaneously eight gigabytes of space to your file system it changes the logical volume underneath and it changes the file system now if you haven't got enough space it will give you as much as it can and then stop and then you need to go and find some more space in your volume group to allocate it to this particular file system you may decide actually this one is about too big and you'd rather give two gigabytes to some other file system so you can actually make it smaller again we're just going to put in the minus 2g to make it two gigs smaller this means that the file system has to have some spare space in it it will deallocate those blocks out of the file system and give them back to the volume group instead of using the plus and minus you can explicitly say look make it 50 gig and if it's smaller it'll make it bigger and if it's too big it'll make it smaller and get you the size you actually want you can also rename the mount point using the minus m option so this is a fast and flexible tool for your systems administrator to get the job done now you don't get to do this very often but you can remove a file system it will remove all the data and give the data box back to your volume group yes again you have to unmount the file systems of course proper gears use u mount not unmount that's for wimps but you, you mount that file system and then you can use the rmfs command and the file system and it goes it will actually leave the mount point there the directory that on which you mounted it if you want to get rid of that as well the minus r in the front there will do that for you quick history lesson now in the good old days where men were real men and that sort of thing we had lots of brown spinning disks for a big database you may have several hundred disks and you could get a performance advantage by very carefully laying out your file systems and the files in them across all your disks to maximum the IO you could do in parallel. There are all sorts of clever techniques with the logical volume manager to create a logical volume that's very nicely spread out so all the disks are involved to get that IO nice and fast. However, these days, if you've got a solid state disk, the way you spread out your data across your SSD makes no difference at all. Every block, it takes you an equal amount of time to extract off the device. Also, if you've got a file system based on fiber channel on a SAN, then disk subsystem is very complex. You may think you have a 32 terabyte chunk of disk out there, but the disk subsystems probably spread that over 200 disks and it's caching on top of that. You've no idea where it is actually placed. 
So, we tend not to worry too much about the way we spread out data across disks these days. But if you wanted to, you could create a logical volume to do some sort of striping across a group of disks. And then when you create a file system, you wanted to create it in that previously defined logical volume. And so there's a command to do that. Normally, the create file system command creates the logical volume for you, but instead of telling it which volume group to get the data from, you say, please use this logical volume. So here we've got a similar sort of command in here. This minus D instead of the minus G, this is the logical volume you want it to put the data in. And then the other options are all exactly the same. Of course, there's no size in here because you've already created the logical volume with the size that you want. So that's the command line done. Very simple commands to get things done. Now, you may want to use Smith or Smitty to do the same operations. In practice, I resize file systems all the time, but I don't create them very often, maybe once a month. But uh, I tend to use the Smitty JFS2 to do that so I can get all the options right. If I was creating uh, 50 file systems in one go on a brand new large system, then I'd probably use Smitty to work out the precise options I want. Use the uh, function 6 to get the actual command lines, put that in a script, uh, cut and paste it so I got all the mount points that are in the right place. When I'm doing resizing, well, I can remember that command, so I just do that at the command line. Very rarely remove file systems. Who wants to throw away data? Now, there's another movie about Smith and Smitty, so I'm not going to go into the fine details of this, just to give you a little show of what's in there, so you can decide whether you want to use a command line or use Smitty. If you type in Smitty GFS2, you get to this panel in here, and you can see the four operations that we've done on the command line are at the top in here. There's some other ones in here we'll come to later on, and there's a whole bunch in here for GFS2 snapshots, and we'll get back to that later on. If you want to do this from the top without using the shortcut, then you type in smit or smitty. We take the storage management option, then we select file systems in here, then we select add change, show and delete file systems, and we want the enhanced journal file system, also known as JFS2, and then we're back round to the top page for JFS2. If we select that option, add enhanced journal file system, then it will say, okay, which volume group do you want that to be placed in? and I used my scratch one. Then we're given a bunch of options in here. By default, this will say megabytes, but who deals with megabytes of data these days? So you hit the tab key and you get to gigabytes, and you put in the number of units of gigabytes, the where to mount it. Do you want it automatically mounted on restart? And then you hit the enter key. That's it, it's done. Don't forget to mount the file system afterwards. If you have X Windows running, then you can go into the graphical mode of Smith, and you can see all the things look the same on the screen. Again, we're asked for which volume group you want to put the data into. All exactly the same questions. You can use the little uh, buttons in here rather than hitting tab keys to get things done. Input what you want, the same details in this case. Hit the OK. You get the running man for a split second and OK. To find the status of our file systems, we're all used to running the df-g command on AX to have it in gigabytes. And we can say, oh, slash temp is missing. Right, so, um, has it gone? What's happening? List file system command, lsfs. Then we can see that temp is there. It said yes for auto, auto mount on booting AIX. But maybe somebody's took it offline or we forgot to run that mount slash temp command after it was created. Another place we can find out about our file systems is slash etc slash file systems. Notice the S on the end. Slash temp was recently created so it's at the bottom of this file and we can find out some more information about it. It is a journal file system too and this is the logical volume that was created to put the file system. We can also see in here an entry to the log, log LV02. So this is the journal file system log. That's shared across the file systems in a volume group. By default there's one log in each volume group for that data. Now a few words about your journal logs. This is the wrong sort of log of course. The JFS2 logs are for file system structure changes, creating and removing directories, creating and removing the files. The actual file data changes are not in this log at all. If you're still reusing old-fashioned now perhaps brown spinning disk and your workload demands creating and removing tens of thousands of files an hour then do watch out for your log performance. If however you're using a modern fiber channel SAN based disk subsystem, SSDs, flash disks or NVMe disks, the I.O. rates these maintain high enough so that you shouldn't get into any logging performance problems. 
If you want to see where they actually exist, the first time you create a journal file system, it will secretly create a log for it as well. This takes up one BP, one block on the disk. In this case it is 256 megabytes of data. It's of type JFS2 log in here and you can see that it's open but not mounted. It's not a file system, it's a raw device, a device full of records for the log. If you wanted to have a look at the root VG, then again when you install AIX, we're going to have one created for you for the root volume group. And here it is, it's called HD8 purely for historic reasons, nothing else. Again, it's only one block. Let's finish off then with a few of the other features we're not going to cover. We have defragging options. You might have noticed them in the Smitty menus. Of course, we shouldn't use those for SSDs or flash devices. They actually age the device unnecessarily with no performance advantage. The same with sand disks because we're not sure how that is placed, so reorganizing it doesn't actually make any difference. And if you've got brown spinning disks, there may be a small performance advantage that you'll get from doing it. Quotas are old school. This means when we had lots of users logging into AIX itself, you could stop one user taking up all the disk space. Well, we don't let people log into AIX anymore as users. We only let have access to the applications. We also have something called an inline log. This could give you a bit of a performance boost by keeping the log with the actual general file system data, which could reduce the amount of seeking across the disk in brown spinning devices. Again, a bit old school. Three more advanced features. We have a no logging feature. If you're going to do a bulk data load of, say, a billion files, we can switch off the logs while you do that because you still have the original copy. You don't need a, a safe file system to do that, but it will give you a good performance boost. You will need to switch that back on before you get take it into production use and get the reliable features back. We have snapshots, gives you instant backups to all our journal file systems. And then we have encrypted JFS. I've got a next slide on that. Mega cool features built into JFS itself. Here are the three videos that you can look at. These are slightly older, a slightly older style to those videos, but the content's still good. I'll put these links into the YouTube page. On the encrypted side, this is a big function. There's nothing to install and no cost. It's built into JFS, just sitting there ready for you to use. If you again look at the Smitty panels, when we were creating a file system, there was a, an option at the bottom, do you want it encrypted, and yes or no. That's how you can switch it on. Then you can either have it set at the whole file system or at a directory or at a single file level. When you have it switched on, the operators or users, when they're doing a backup of a file, they're never able to see the clear data. It's encrypted all the way through. So even your root users can't sneak into your files and have a quick look. It's actually simple to operate once you've got set up and transparent to your applications, provided they have access to the access keys to actually open the files. Some examples in there, you could make your entire database encrypted rather than making the database do that. You could have a directory, perhaps of all your secret files that you don't want people to see, or you're protecting uh, user data. We can have encrypted files, perhaps just for the payroll. And also, if you have industry security regulations, this can fulfill all your needs. Okay, that's it for this movie, The Journal File System 2. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to be told when my next movie's out.